Dominic Steele, a perilous moment. That is how the Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Rafal, described the situation in the Anglican Church of Australia, or the situation the church is in, after an important vote this week in the denomination's National Synod. After being delayed twice due to COVID, the leaders of the Australian National Church gathered on the Gold Coast this week. It was the first Anglican General Synod since the marriage plebiscite. And Archbishop Ruffell and others attempted to call on the Synod to reaffirm the Christian, biblical and historic Anglican position on marriage, the union between a man and a woman. The vote, well, on the floor, there was a consensus that there was a strong majority in favour of the Archbishop's position, the Bible's position, roughly 60-40. But when it came to a vote, the Synod voted by houses, laity, clergy and bishops. In the laity, the numbers were 63 to 47 in favour. In the clergy, the numbers were 70 to 39 in favour. But in the House of Bishops, it was lost by 10 in support and 12 votes against, with two abstentions. So today, on The Pastor's Heart, we are speaking first to the Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Rafal, and in a few moments we will talk with the Chair of GAFCON Australia, Bishop Richard Condy of Tasmania, and Re Reverend Jennifer Hercott from Queensland. She's also on the GAFCON Australia board. Kanishka, thank you for coming in after what's been an enormous week for you. Um, I wonder if we could start with your pastor's heart and just emotionally where you're at after yeah. all that's happened this yeah, week. Yeah, thank you, Dominic. I think it has been... Uh, an emotional week for everybody, uh, really, on all sides, um, and uh, certainly uh, there's been uh, a sense, uh, certainly I experience a sense of uh, grief and sadness over our inability to send a clear signal on this subject, um, uh, but I have been um, encouraged, I think I've been um, encouraged and upheld by a couple of uh, verses from Scripture. Um, I think of uh, Matthew 16, uh, Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says in response to that, upon this rock I will build my church and death will not prevail against it. Uh, and so I'm uh, greatly encouraged and sustained uh, by Jesus' promise to build his church, as indeed I was through the General Synod, uh, by so many across the country who have a testimony of faithfully bearing witness to the Lord Jesus uh, and um, God answering their prayers uh, and uh, winning disciples um, and building his church in that way. And then the other, the other thing that I think has uh, been encouraging me again is the words of Jesus in John 6 uh, when he says he is the bread of heaven uh, and uh, uh, some, uh, John records that uh, you know the disciples said this is a hard saying, and some of them began to leave him. And he looks at Peter, and he said, and he looks at the twelve, uh, and he says, "Are you are you going to desert me as well?" And Peter says, speaking for the twelve, uh, "Where else have we to go? You alone have words of eternal life." Mm -hmm. And so, um, in the midst of considerable turmoil and uh, depth of feeling and all the rest of it. We hear the words of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, uh, the one who speaks to us words of eternal life, words of life, uh, and we hear his promise to build his church. So I must say, in the midst of it all, uh, I'm clinging to the Lord and to his promise. Mm. Take me to Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, and that vote. For those who don't know, mm. what was the argument that you were putting? Sure. Well, um, the, uh, the statement that we presented simply sought to do three things which the General Synod has done in the past but has not had a chance to do since the changes to the Commonwealth Marriage Act uh, and the decision of the Anglican Church Appellate Tribunal um, that blessings of same-sex marriages uh, contracted civilly were not unconstitutional. Um, the appellate tribunal said, we're not going to comment on whether it's consistent with scripture, but for the purposes of the constitution, um, you know, it can proceed. So this was the opportunity to clarify that position. And so we simply asked the General Synod to say what it has said in the past. Uh, and it said it the last time that we met in 2017, 
uh, that Jesus teaches that marriage is the union, uh, the lifelong exclusive union of a man and a woman, um, and that therefore uh, um, same-sex marriages and the blessing of same-sex marriages are inconsistent with that teaching. Um, there, was, there were a number of amendments moved, most of which failed, uh, but there was one amendment which succeeded and I was very happy for it. Uh, it noted the resolution of General Synod in 2004 um, that uh, same-sex marriages and the blessing of same-sex marriages couldn't be recommended, but that there was a conversation going on uh, it's an issue of importance to many people and we need to listen to each other respectfully. Uh, and the um, other amendment that was accepted was to say the change in the Commonwealth Marriage Act creates a new missional and pastoral context. And it's precisely for those reasons that we brought it, in mm. fact. And so I said in my speech, I think these amendments actually make this even better. And it's now quite an unremarkable statement. Mm. It's consistent not only with the decisions of General Synod in the past, but also clearly with the teaching of the Bible and with our Anglican uh, liturgies and formularies. Um, and so it was an opportunity to make that statement again. Hmm. Um, passed by a substantial majority in the laity and the clergy, hmm. and then there were tears in the room hmm. when the announcement from the House of Bishops came out. Correct. So each house voted uh, sequentially, and so we, we knew that it had passed in late in the clergy. We knew the margins, uh, and then um, really, I, I must say, I was I was shocked and dismayed to find uh, that um, that it had not passed in the House of Bishops. So the moment for a clear statement uh, about the teaching of this church uh, was lost. And um, as you say, there were tears on the floor because uh, it just created confusion all around. Um, and that is why I use that word perilous, because uh, we seem to fail to affirm something it should have been straightforward to affirm. Hmm. You've urged care and respect in hmm. the way that we speak about those we disagree with. Of course. But um, it would seem that we don't share a common understanding of scripture, a common understanding of the teaching of Christ, and in fact the Anglican formularies. Well, it's certainly very um, uh, disappointing that the opportunity to affirm that was lost. And so I think there'll be many uh, people in, uh, in various dioceses who will want to engage with their bishops and try and understand what they meant uh, by voting against this motion. Um, and uh, in fact, I think as a House of Bishops, we need to have that conversation. I've said that to the primate, um, that I think uh, this is really um, something difficult to understand uh, and of the most serious nature. Uh, as we know, um, the failure to make this kind of statement in other places or the making of statements which are contrary to the historic biblical position in places like Canada and the United States and New Zealand. Um, it has led to, a, uh, to the formation of alternative parallel Anglican jurisdictions. Mm. It, it is a matter, it has proven to be across the communion of the most serious importance. So there's conversation to be had. So I'm just checking, I've, I've got that clear. So you're essentially you're calling for a meeting of bishops to discuss this. Uh, well, I think, I think there should be a meeting of bishops. There is a, bit, uh, there is a bishops meeting planned for later in the year. Uh, uh, already, um, and I hope it'll. I hope we'll have that expeditiously. How does what's happened here differ, if at all, mm. from what's happened in Canada, America, Brazil, Scotland, New mm. Zealand? Mm. Uh, well, um, uh, one of the differences has to do with uh, um, the government of the church. So, in some of those other jurisdictions, when the national synod makes a resolution. Uh, all the other dioceses and parishes and clergy are bound by it. Our structure is looser than that. Uh, so there is that kind of difference. Um, and in fact, of course, the, uh, the doctrine of marriage of the Anglican Church has not changed. Mm -hmm. uh, there hasn't been any change. We've just simply failed to affirm what it is um, in, in this current context, following the appellate tribunal decision and the changes to the Commonwealth legislation. Uh, so we have some uncertainty about that. Um, uh, and what will happen, I think, is that 
in every diocese, this conversation will uh, arise um, and uh, it will be a matter for synods and parishes uh, really to work out what they are going to affirm about uh, marriage and how that how that affects relationships within mm. the diocese and nationally. Mm. The second big statement was on chastity and unchastity. Um, yes. And the Synod did vote in favour of that motion. Yes, all three houses. All three houses. And I thought implicitly that motion defined marriages between a man and a woman as well. Did I read that? I mean, and then I thought there's a contradiction. Well, no, you're absolutely right. It's not implicit, it's explicit. It's explicit in the terms of the uh, statement. Um, that uh, marriage so is between a man and a woman. we rejected it in motion one and approved it in motion two. Or yes, statement one statement yes. Two. I, I, if I recall correctly, I think two bishops switched their votes for the statement. Uh, so it passed in all three houses. And yes, there is something that is uh, inconsistent and contradictory about that. Um, I was kind of expecting something to blow up at the Synod, um, and it didn't. Um, uh, but what are what is the position we're in now? <laughs> <laughs> well, we well we are in the position where the appellate tribunal has said that the blessing of same-sex marriages is not inconsistent with the constitution, uh, and the general synod has failed to affirm that it is inconsistent with the Bible. Uh, a question the appellate tribunal declined to answer. Um, so really, we haven't advanced. Uh, we haven't advanced, and um, I think the primate was quoted in The Australian yesterday, and if he was quoted correctly, then he said uh, it, it was already the case that there was a green light uh, for the blessing of same-sex marriages uh, in the diocese uh, because of the appellate tribunal decision. And that is going to be um, a, a point of division uh, within dioceses uh, that adopt that, I suspect, and it will be a point of division nationally as well. I'm imagining you'd be calling on the other bishops to continue to exercise restraint there. I would certainly do so. Um, that uh, uh, although we have a loose structure, although dioceses have the opportunity and the authority to make their own decisions, um, I think uh, if you are concerned for a national fellowship, then at the very least, this ought to be something that we talk together about. Mm. Thanks for coming and talking to us today. Thank you, Dominic. Good to be here. That is the Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Raffel. And uh, let us go to GAFCON now and uh, GAFCON Australia Chair, the uh, Bishop of Tasmania, Richard Condy. And uh, he's back in Tasmania from the Gold Coast. And uh, Reverend Jennifer Hercott from the uh, Diocese of uh, Rockhampton. She is a GAFCON Australia board member. And uh, look, I want to talk with you guys uh, through these big moments of the conference, uh, the Synod, this last week. Um, uh, Jennifer, I wonder if we could start with you and that crucial moment uh, when the bishops voted 10 to 12 against the teaching of Christ and the constitution of the church. Um, there was a profound surprise. Um, I, I think there, we, there was a silence that went through the room um, and you know, there, was, there was tears. Um, I'm grateful that the Synod uh, agreed to stop and pray. Um, so at every table, people uh, were praying. They were seeking God's guidance. They were looking for um, a way of understanding what had just occurred. Um, and I think people are still um, wrestling with that as we've, we've gone home. What does this now mean for ministry in our, in, in our own diocese? Um, and what's the step forward now as, uh, as a communion? You, you had the sense that um, not all the bishops quite understood the significance of their vote. Is that right? Uh, and looked at those who are in the House of Bishops, there seemed to be a look of surprise for a number of them as well. Um, I don't... I would like to believe that they didn't believe that we would end up there. I would like to believe that they thought um, that uh, we would uphold what we have said previously, that um, marriage is between a man and a woman, um, and that they would be seeking to walk forward in lockstep as a communion across Australia. Richard Condy, it is a frustration that after four years of saying it was all going to get resolved this week, it hasn't been. 
Well, so, uh, Dominic, in 2017, we commissioned a series of essays uh, for on, on this topic uh, to, to help the church dis, dis, uh, discern its mind on same-sex marriage. Uh, obviously, in the intervening period, the Bishop of Wangaratta went ahead uh, without uh, any blessing of um, of the General Synod uh, to do what he did in establishing this regulation to allow for the blessing of same-sex marriage. And then we've been told ever since the Appellate Tribunal brought down its opinion that we needed to wait for General Synod to make up its mind. And my great disappointment is that essentially the General Synod has made no has not declared its mind on this matter. We've, we've basically said nothing on uh, what we think about the theology of marriage uh, out of this synod. And I think this is the failure of the bishops. So lay people and clergy came with amendments to the statement. They engaged with the statement. Uh, but the bishops didn't bring any amendments. Uh, one of the archbishops spoke in the debate and said... He thought we needed more time to discuss this matter. Well, we've been talking about this matter for years and years. And we had all been told that this was the moment we needed to declare our mind. So in, in one sense, it, it, it is even more disappointing that we've said nothing than, than if we'd said something that I didn't fully agree with. Uh, and so I, I think it was, it, to me, the disappointment that the bishops didn't engage the question or come up with an alternative. And now the talk is, let's get together and see if we can come up with a statement we can all agree on. Well, I just think it's too late for that. Uh, we can't expect the church to continue to, uh, to exercise restraint on this matter uh, while we try and work out what to do. This was the moment and we failed. Uh, to do what we, we went there to do. And I got the sense that there was a grassroot annoyance, frustration with the House of Bishops. Um, when, I, when I say I got the sense, there was a petition saying we're frustrated with the House of Bishops. Um, no, no, you read, read, the, read the petition, which was a majority of the members of the Senate. Well, let me read it. Um, noting with regret that on the 11th of May 2022, Despite clear support from the majority of General Synod, including majorities in the Houses of Laity and Clergy, the majority of the House of Bishops voted against Motion 20.3, statements as to the faith, ritual, ceremonial or discipline of this church made under Section 4 of the Constitution. The petitioners humbly pray that Synod commits to praying that all members of the House of Bishops would clearly affirm and be united in their support for the teaching of Christ concerning marriage and the principles of marriage reflected in the Book of Common Prayer. We also request that the petition be read to the Synod by one of the secretaries. Now, that's quite an extraordinary statement for the petition voted on by more than half and signed by more than half of the Synod members says, the bishops have failed to affirm the teaching of Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, now, I'm just thinking aloud here, Richard. If, if somebody who I respected came to me and told me that I had got the teaching of Jesus Christ wrong, I would go and spend significant amount. Of, I mean, I, that would be mortifying for me. And if it was the case that a majority of the leaders of the Church of God of Australia came to me and said, I had got the teaching of Christ wrong. Well, I'd, I'd take a sabbatical, I'd consider resigning. I'd, um, I'd, I would be horrified, devastated. Um, is it, am I reading this wrong? Well, look, I think, uh, Dominic, m many of the bishops feel they have read the scriptures of right. So I, they have uh, studied and thought and they've come up with a view of marriage that they think is right. Um, there are a few, I think, who uh, share my view on marriage, who voted against the statement, um, thinking that the statement perhaps needed to be more nuanced so that it included more people uh, more people's support. So I think it's not, it's not as straightforward and as simple as you put it. 
because uh, those bishops really feel like they've done the right thing. And, and then, of course, there's those who really believe, in essence, what the statement was saying about marriage but thought it was the wrong way to do it. It's a very blunt instrument. It's a blunt instrument to go to a meeting and pass a resolution to try and settle a matter that, you know, like we're talking about real people here, real people in our churches who are who are same-sex attracted and wanting to live out the blessing of God in their life and so on. And so it is a blunt instrument to do it, but it is the only instrument we have. And we've been told for ages that this was the place to do it. And the only per people who had put forward any method of dealing with it was the Diocese of Sydney in their statement. And so um, there, there was a motion that was put forward at the Synod uh, in support of same-sex marriage. Um, and uh, it failed, but uh, that, that conversation was a good one for us to have, and we heard some uh, moving speeches uh, in favour of blessing of same-sex marriages and so on, and that, that's the work that we should have done, but uh, we didn't do it. Hmm. What happens now, Jennifer? Um, I don't believe there's anyone sitting here today or, or many people around the Anglican Church that wants to split the church in any way, shape or form. And I don't think we're, we're at that point. Uh, we still have the statement that we had before. I think that the, uh, the issue that I see now is that before General Synod, um, the primate had, uh, had urged restraint until General Synod made its mind up. Um, I'm not sure whether that handbrake's been removed. And if people start um, openly blessing same-sex unions within the Anglican Church of Australia. I can't say how some dioceses may respond to that. Um, I think the way forward from here needs to be one of genuine listening. It has to be one of walking together um, and urging everybody to come back to the foundations that make us truly Anglican. Uh, the scriptures and our founding documents are the place that we need to start. And I know that uh, we failed to um, endorse those also at General Synod. Um, however, there was a mind and a feeling across the floor that the place to go is back, back to the scriptures, back to the beginning, and to walk forward in union from there. Take us to that vote on the Friday morning. Maybe Richard, you could explain what happened, that attempt to have a unifying statement around the scriptures. Yes, yeah, so uh, on the Friday morning, a, a motion was uh, put uh, about the, uh, our, essentially about our diversity and, and saying, um, I think the mover of the motion said, we wanna count you in before we count you out in terms of our relationships with each other. But uh, the, the, the motion didn't, um, didn't say on what basis we count you in. So an amendment was put to really attach our fundamental declarations from the Constitution to the start of the motion. And uh, there was significant debate, and a lot of people were debating that these words were quite divisive and that they shouldn't be in the motion. Uh, it was narrowly passed just by a few votes that um, these statements of our fundamental declarations should be in the motion at the start as a sort of basis of our unity and uh, the, the sort of the, the foundation point for the diversity we find in the Anglican Church. Uh, because that was such a narrow vote, uh, someone then moved a procedural motion that the whole motion not be put. And so I think it was a a really that was a, a really sad moment that we couldn't uh, as a synod un unanimously affirm the fundamental declarations of the Anglican Church as the basis for uh, what we hold in common when we're recognizing the diversity on some matters and so eventually the whole motion uh, was lost uh, well, well not lost but was not put and so uh, we moved on to other business uh, so that, that, was a, that was a sad moment, I think, of not actually being able to affirm wholeheartedly uh, the, the, the foundations of who we are. I think the real concern going forward is for the parish where you might have a, an evangelical or faithful to the Bible parish under a bishop um, who, well, <laughs> not my language, but the language of the General Synod, has failed to affirm the teaching of Christ. Um, how does GAFCON support that parish? So, look, this has been the issue uh, right around uh, the Western Anglican world 
this has been the watershed moment where people no longer feel they can receive the ministry of their bishop because of these matters in particular. Uh, so I'm not uh, prophetic. I don't know how many parishes will feel this way or what, what but, but our history tells us that churches will feel they can no longer receive the ministry of their bishop. So what AFCON has done internationally is committed to two things. Once, one, the, the promotion of uh, Orthodox Anglicanism, and secondly, the fellowship with people who feel they can no longer receive the ministry of their bishop or sit under their leadership. So we know that congregations may well decide to leave the Anglican Church of Australia. We also recognise that those congregations are Anglican. They, they uphold Anglican doctrine. They want Anglican order. And so GAFCON Australia has said that we'll stand with them. We've established uh, an, an extra provincial diocese, a diocese outside the province of Australia uh, called the Diocese of the Southern Cross. And at the moment, it's really a sleeper organisation. It's just sitting there, uh, has no members, uh, but it is prepared to welcome uh, congregations uh, that leave the Anglican Church of Australia. We're not promoting anyone leave. We're not running around trying to build schism, asking people to leave the Anglican Church. But if they do, we're there to provide Anglican structures and fellowship and theology for them. Uh, and uh, so this Diocese of the Southern Cross, which is has the form of a company limited by guarantee, will allow uh, parishes to or congregations to join uh, the, the new diocese uh, should they feel they need to. We don't want to see it happen. I'd much prefer to see the Anglican Church of Australia reformed, stay together, uh, but uh, if people feel they need to leave, then that's a, that's a lifeboat for them. It's a safe haven uh, for them to remain Anglican. It's, it's a digression, but Diocese of the Southern Cross is an awesome name and so much better than a racist name like Anglican that it excludes multicultural Australia. And so um, maybe the National Church, if, if we sure. solved this problem, they could steal sure. that name. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the more crucial point, to come back to what you just said, Richard, um, if I am a minister in one of those liberal dioceses and my bishop has failed to affirm the teaching of Christ, then actually there's a very real chance that I won't respect him as an elder in Christ over me and a very real chance that I won't um, want him to preach to my people. Oh, well, I think that's right. And we're seeing um, lots of people make contact uh, with us. They, they have been over the last few years, uh, wanting to know what the plan is, wanting to know, do they still have a place within the Anglican movement worldwide? Um, we know already that a number of people have left the Anglican Church of Australia and have joined the Presbyterians or joined the local Baptist church or somewhere else that's going to teach them the Bible, uh, where, the, where the structures are not, uh, you, you know, there, there's, there's no Episcopal oversight and so on. Uh, and that's a great sadness. Uh, so I think if you, you are in that situation, you may be considering whether you can submit to the bishop. Uh, Ang Anglicans. You know, Anglican clergy submit to the lawful direction of their bishops, and if they feel that their bishops have failed them, then that, that, that strains those relationships. Uh, it's because we take the bishops so seriously that uh, that, that situation uh, has occurred. And Richard, you have this big GAFCON conference coming up in August. Yes, the GAFCON Australasia conference is being held in Canberra in August. Uh, 14 to 16, I think it is, something like that. You'd better check the dates. But uh, gathering uh, GAFCON uh, supporters from all over Australia and New Zealand and the Pacific. Uh, we've got Ashley Null coming to speak to us uh, about uh, charity and diversity, and he'll be wonderful uh, helping us with that. We should have uh, Foley Beach and Ben Quashy from the GAFCON International Movement uh, along with us as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's a ministry-oriented conference, Dominic, uh, trying to encourage us to think about how we go about reaching Australia for Christ and building us up uh, in that, but also, of course, talking about uh, the challenges that we have at the moment and the future of uh, what it means to be Anglican in Australia today. And looking forward to 
seeing you at that. <laughs> My guests on The Pastor's Heart are Richard Condy, the Bishop of Tasmania, but also the Chair of the GAFCON Australia Board, and Jennifer Hercott, who is also on the GAFCON Australia Board and that big conference that they have planned for us in August. Thanks for joining us on The Pastor's Heart, and we will look forward to your company next week.